Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Welcome to our Sunday worship service. It's great to see you here today, and we welcome all of you watching online from home as well. Um, Natty Kaplan is here today again to sing solo and to lead us in hymns. If you're watching on Facebook, we invite you to start a watch party or share the video of today's service with your friends. Thank you. Um, as usual, we hope God has given each of you a blessing in some way this past week. Um, we pray for the health and well-being of all of our church family. Um, we have a lot of people who are hurting right now in need of our prayers. As this is Memorial Day weekend, we honor and remember the men and women who gave their lives in military service to preserve our freedoms, much like Jesus gave his life and sacrifice as a ransom for many. I have one announcement that I would like to mention, just to stress in the bulletin today, the very first announcement about the annual meeting, which was postponed in January. It will take place on Sunday, June 20th at 11 a.m., or immediately after the worship service. We will try to meet outside if the weather cooperates and it's not too hot, and likely sitting in chairs placed on the road behind the church so traffic noise doesn't interfere. Um, we have very important issues to address concerning the church, including a vote on the church's future and a vote on what our mask policy will be going forward, as well in light of changes in the COVID situation. Um, please let me know if you can make it. Um, if you haven't done so yet, we need at least 19 members to attend to have a quorum. To see the rest of the announcements in the bulletin, you can go to our website at dccdearborn.org, click on DCC Home, and then Weekly Bulletin. Or if you're on Facebook, go to our church Facebook page, look for the post promoting this service, and click on the links to bring up the bulletin directly. A quick announcement, which isn't in your bulletin today, uh, I mentioned this last week too, Carol McAdam has planned a memorial service uh, for her husband, Matt, who passed on May 8th at the age of 80. Uh, the service will be here on Saturday, August 14th at 11 a.m. with a reception following Celebrating Max Life, which will be on the front lawn. Um, also, I, I would like also to today to wish Kevin Shilby a happy birthday. Kevin's birthday is coming up on Tuesday, June 1st, and the flowers on the altar today are in honor and remembrance of all of our veterans who gave their lives in service to our country. Let us worship.
Please stand for the call to worship. Peter called to the people. Inviting them to unity and solidarity in Christ. To break bread together. And, and to worship together. We too hear the call. To join the many generations before us. Worshiping a God who love, whose love transcends time and age. Telling the stories of God's mighty acts in our midst. Let us praise God together, all of us. Young and old, rich and poor, one people united in a celebration of faith. <coughs> Please join me in the prayer of invocation. Heavenly Father, we pray for multiplication to happen in this place. Let us study and pray to learn the tools to expand your kingdom and obey the final commission of Jesus before he ascended to your throne to make disciples. Let us grow in faith so that others will see this city on a hill. Thanks for grace. And let us follow your example and be gracious to others. In Jesus' name, amen. You may be seated. It's time.
time now to open our hearts and minds to the word of the Lord this morning. The scripture readings from the book of Acts. From Acts 2. And they devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and the fellowship, to the breaking of bread and the prayers. And awe came upon every soul, and many wonders and signs were being done through the apostles. And all who believed were together and had all things in common. And they were selling their possessions and belongings and distributing the proceeds to all as any had need. And day by day, attending the temple together and breaking bread in their homes, they received their food with glad and generous hearts, praising God and having favor with all the people. And the Lord added to their number, day by day, those who were being saved. And from Acts 4. Now the full number of those who believed were of one heart and soul. And no one said that any of the things that belonged to him was his own, but they had everything in common. And with great power, the apostles were giving their testimony to the resurrection of the Lord Jesus. And great grace was upon them all. There was not a needy person among them, for as many as were owners of lands or houses sold them and brought the proceeds of what was sold and laid it at the apostles' feet. And it was distributed to each as any had need. Thus Joseph, who was also called by the apostles Barnabas, which means son of encouragement, a Levite, a native of Cyprus, sold a field that belonged to him and brought the money and laid it at the apostles' feet. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. God.
adding. <clears throat> How much does it uh, cost to raise a child? Some of you might know that. <laughs> <coughs> I found an article that details the cost uh, to raise a child born in the 70s to the birth age of 17. Do you want to know? <laughs> the Department of Agricultural estimates it cost about $280,000 or about $15,000 a year, and that doesn't include any college um, funding. Um, and it costs about $3,000 a year, even including taking in consideration the cost of food in the 70s, 80s, and 90s, and 70s and 80s, about $3,000 a year to feed a teenager. I was talking with Ann before, Ann had three. <laughs> I said that comes to about $900,000. You would have, right now, Ann, <laughs> have, poor Jay. <laughs> and twins. And twins, yeah, and, that, and twins, there it's not a BOGO with twins, is it? <laughs> In fact, she was telling me when they were born, not only did the doctor charge for a separate delivery, which she said, which was okay, but also she got charged for two delivery rooms, <laughs> two delivery room charges. They should have a cap on it, like if you know, one is born less than three minutes after the other one, <laughs> you get a deal. But if you talk to most parents, they say they wouldn't change anything for the world. And you see so many parents that sacrifice for their children because it's normal. Uh, it's not normal to be um, selfish when you have children. Raising children requires a great deal of self-sacrifice. It's costly financially, emotionally, spiritually, and relationally. Raising children requires a deep level of self-sacrifice. But if you talk to most parents, they'll tell you it's worth it, and it's expected. The sacrifice that you make is simply a part of the parenting equation. You didn't decide to have kids and figure out that it would cost almost $300,000 to raise by the 17. You had kids, and you loved them, and you did what was expensive, expected. It was just part of your equation. And if you're going to grow your family, you must be part of the mix. Selfish and stinginess do not work well with parenting. I had a mother not too long ago who took piano lessons along with her daughter. This cute little girl that was quite good. And um, usually, if that situation has happened, and it's happened to me many times, a lot of times if the mother was busy cooking dinner or doing something or working or you know doing something, she would say, can you just give a little bit more time to so and so, and I'll come in for the last 15 minutes. Well, this mother was different. She would come, and the child would have about 10 more minutes left, and she would come in, and she would say, You know what? She's not doing very well. I mean, give me her time. <laughs> there was this really feeling of competition between this little girl and the mother that wasn't normal. It's not normal. But cost of parenting. Church, it's very costly. We're in the middle of an eight week series on the subject of multiplication in the church. And as I read our text for today's message, I couldn't help but see the connection between parenting and the multiplication of the gospel. In the same way that launching children is expensive and costful, it is the same with gospel multiplication. There is a different equation and another value set at work, and this is what we're going to explore today. So before we jump in, let's go for a brief uh, review. We're trying to answer three questions through this series. Number one, what were the ingredients for the missional movement of the early church? How did the original church grow from 12 to 3,000 and then 5,000 and now across the globe? Christianity is the, the largest um, religion in the world. What unique message mission is God calling Dearborn Congregational to in 2021? So as we look at this, when we look at you know uh, different weeks and different subjects we study, what, what is our role and what can we do differently? And three, what is your spirit-empowered mission? What has God given you that you can do to further multiplication and the kingdom. In the first week, we looked at our vision of 
multiplication. In terms of Jerusalem, here, Judea and Samaria, people that are different from us, and the ends of the earth. And for two weeks, we talked about prayer and how it is the fuel for gospel work. And last week, we learned how the gospel advances as God works through words through each one of us to win the world. And last week, we prayed the prayer. Open the door, open my mouth, open their heart. So I've chosen two sets of verses in the second chapter of Acts so that you can see a particular pattern that is instructive. And with these two, bar two paragraphs are two key verses. Now, verse 44, if you look at your text in your bulletin, for those, if there's somebody here that didn't bring their own Bible to church, you've got a bulletin that said that I was a, a dig. It was just a dig, I'm sorry. <laughs> Yeah, the reason why I'd like you to bring your own Bible to church, if you're like me, so my uh, my sister bought me a, um, a big print Bible that I asked for for Christmas because I there's not, not I, my eyes are bad and so I I couldn't find anything in it because I'm used to my own Bible, so I don't necessarily know where it is in my scripture or verse, I know that it's in this section of the Bible on the right-hand side at the top. Does anybody else's mind think that way? Yeah. And so when I switched Bibles, it was like, it was it was terrible. It's, it's the same Maddie as a musician, Ann and Jay, and those of you who are musicians, it's, if, if I play the same edition of a piece, a classical piece, over and over again, and somebody gives me a different <laughs> edition with different print, if the print is a different uh, volume, it throws me, it's unbelievable. It's like I've never played it before in my, in my life. It's just funny how we become creatures of habit. So if you bring your own Bible to church, not only can you get used to your own translation, but you'll get used to where that is. Plus, it's a good idea to check if you like your translation or you get an idea. So don't be afraid um, to bring your Bible. See, Valerie's got it. You can do that. Oh, look at Valerie. Yeah. I never thought of that. Those of you who have smartphones, oh. wait a minute, you're sending a text to someone about what's for dinner. <laughs> <laughs> Valerie's got her text right in front of her. God bless you, Valerie. So the, the first one is Acts uh, 2.44, and it says, All who believed were together and had all things in common. And then 32, Now the number of those who believed were one heart and one soul, and no one said that any of these things that belonged to him was his own, but they had all things in common. So these texts highlight what we're going to be talking about today, graciousness and generosity. And there's three highlights or critical aspects of generosity that we're going to talk about today. Number one is conviction. All who believed, they believed and they were convicted. Number two is emotion, that they were together and they were of one heart and one soul, and no one said any of these things that belonged to him was his own. And number three is action. They had all things in common. They had everything in common. And they sold some of their own possessions. They were looking around for opportunities and things they could sell to meet the needs of those in their midst that were needy. Each of these are vitally important for a culture of generosity to be created. Without them, generosity doesn't work. But multiplication doesn't work either. What we think, what we feel, what we do are all connected to our ability to hold positions, whatever they are. Loosely, generosity and multiplications are deeply connected. So let's look. Number one is conviction. That's the first aspect of generosity. Generosity is a product of what a person or community believes. It's what you believe. We'll get to other areas of generosity that are more familiar, such as a cheerful heart or actually doing something. But it is important that we start here because generosity, or lack thereof, shows what you believe. People are stingy or, or greedy or generous based on what they believe. Um, I did some research on hoarders this week. One article said that hoarders assign too much value to their possessions, making it difficult or impossible to or decide to get rid of them. One of the characteristics of hoarding is that people feel the sense of discomfort if they feel like they may be giving something away that they could use in the future. Patients often become greatly distressed or even angry if they approach to give up the uh, up future uh, apparently useless or excess possessions. 
At the root of hoarding is a foundational belief system. Now, how many have known someone that either was on the borderline a hoarder or, or an actual hoarder? Yeah, I do. And um, it's, oh, it's so distasteful. I mean, you just want to say, what's wrong with you that you're, you know, we talked about uh, in, in a sermon uh, back in, uh, in last year where I talked about the curl, about hanging on to things, mm -hmm. hanging on to things. So many, so, so, uh, so many hoarders have multiplic multi multiplication of things that they don't need and they're not willing to give it up because they believe those possessions fill something more than um, what they have. Um, same is true with parenting, just the opposite. That's why I use the parenting thing. Um, because you love your children so much, you're able to sacrifice for them because your love for your children is greater than your love for possessions. So you might go without a new car to take care of your kid or to send them to college, or you may take out a loan for something they need because your love for them is greater than for your love for possessions. What the early church believed was the resurrection and their love for what Jesus had done for them before the grace that they had received was greater than the love for their possessions. And their love for each brother and sister in their midst as they had in all things in common was greater than their love for the things they wanted. In fact, they had such great care and act such great uh, extravagance grace that they actually looked at their possessions as opportunities of things that they could sow to take care of one another. When was the last time you sold something to take care of somebody? Somebody may have. You know, if I haven't, I've given stuff away, but I've never thought, gee, you know, I have an extra whatever I have, I'm going to sell it um, uh, to because somebody needs uh, 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 help with medical bills or somebody does, isn't working right now and, or somebody um, is sick and needs to be taken care of. I've never done that before. You know, now one thing that I, I believe this church does take care of one another very, very well. We've had members that have had GoFundMe pages and things like that and I think our members have responded very, very well. And so uh, I love that's one thing I do love about the um, this uh, this uh, particular congregation, I, I do think there is a sense of belonging and there is a sense of resp responsibility and love for each another. We really excel in this area. So I want to remind you that both of our texts are placed in the book of Acts. The first text, Acts 2, 42 and 47, follows the amazing conversion of the 3,000 at Pentecost, which we talked about last week. The second text follows the real persecution and a prayer meeting that was invaded by the Holy Spirit. These texts both describe the kind of community that marked them as the church, and the church continued to prosper. This community is identified as a group of believers. They believed in something. They believed that Jesus was crucified and he was both Lord and Christ, if we look back to Peter's sermon. They believed that he was the Son of God. They believed he was the Messiah and that he rose from the dead. And they also believed that at the name of Jesus, they could be forgiven and they could receive the Holy Spirit. Essentially, they believed the gospel. Even though they were guilty and deserving of God's wrath, they could be counted righteousness because of Jesus. They were believers and had faith in him. They believed that the promise of grace was for those who were far off. Acts 2.39 and this belief led to the apostles' teaching, to fellowship, to breaking of bread, and to prayer. But everything, including their generosity, flowed from their belief in what Jesus had done for him. That the guilty can be forgiven. That the good news that Jesus came for the undeserving. This is the belief in which the foundation of the church's community and Christianity and how we should be generous. Through the New Testament, this conviction is the gospel, and it becomes the basis for many forms of generosity. Look at Philippians 2. Believers are told to consider others more important than themselves, as they consider the example of Christ, who took on the form of a humble servant to the point of death on the cross. In 2 Corinthians, Paul attempted to motivate the Christians at Corinth to give generously by appealing to their belief in what Jesus did. He said, Paul wrote, For you know the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, that though he was rich, yet for your sake 
he became poor, so that you by his poverty might become rich. Charles Spurgeon, the great minister, summarizes it like this. The Lord Jesus Christ was eternally rich, glorious, and exalted. But though he was rich, yet for her, his, your sake he became poor. It is impossible that our divine Lord could have had fellowship with us unless he had given to us from his own abounding wealth and had become poor so as to make us rich. You see, underneath our fundamental sense of understanding of generosity is a fundamental belief system. What you believe about the gospel informs others how you view yourselves, others, and your possessions. God's grace has a direct effect on you and how you view the entire subject of generosity and by implication multiplication. Graced people are gracious. You know, we talk again about the parent that's stingy with his child, you know, and um, what if every day, you know, you, when you saw your mother, Jay, she goes, $300,000 every morning. <laughs> and look at it. $300,000. Right? Yep. We gave birth to you. $300,000. It's not only natural, but it's wrong. And so that biblical generosity also flows from a fundamental conviction of love that causes us to be give. And ungracious people give evidence that they have not experienced God's grace. This just isn't all about giving either, you know? I'm, I'm telling you, Christians need to be more gracious in their conduct. You know, even in driving, and I usually don't like to talk about driving because, you know, uh, all of us are guilty of the driver experience. But, you know, before you um, gesture to the person that cuts you off or the person that doesn't know how to drive in a, a roundabout, or before you um, yell at, at, at someone in the car who had nothing to do with what that other driver did and make everyone uncomfortable, maybe you should consider what the person who cut you off or did the infraction is going through. Maybe they're on the way to the hospital to see a loved one who's dying. Maybe they're sick. Maybe they're in the midst of a marital conflict. We need to be more gracious with people. When uh, see, see, it's pride. That's <laughs> what it is. It's absolutely pride. Because what happens is this. You are not thinking that they're better than you, as we're commanded to do. You're thinking, look what that person has done to me. And that stupid person that doesn't know how to drive. Maybe that person is an old person that's just a little bit slower. And as my dad used to say, you might as well pick, you, pick, pick yourself out one of them because you're going to be just like them someday. <laughs> so be gracious in the way you drive. Be gracious when you're... When you're at the restaurant and you, you have employees that are working for you, you know, right now there's a shortage of help everywhere you go, so you're going to wait a little longer. Go to the, go. When you go out, go with the attitude that I, I'll wait if I have to. You know, when we were socially distancing, that's what I said to myself. I said, you're not going to be impatient. Number one, we were going into the grocery stores and it was eerie and people were staying so far away from each other. So what I would do is I resolved to do this, and I trust me when I tell you that I have a ton of faults. But I decided that I was not going to go anywhere without having patience. So if I were in the grocery store and someone was taking their time finding something near I needed to do, but I needed to stay six feet away from them, I didn't say excuse me and jump in and grab anything. I didn't do anything. I just sat there and waited for them to buy whatever they wanted to. I, I couldn't go anywhere. I had more time than I had money, so what's the big deal? Be gracious with each other, and especially be gracious with your family, because as I said, gracious Christ, Christians who experience grace and believe grace. What is a culture of extravagant grace? This is that we desire to be a community of believers to treat others with the same extravagant <laughs> grace that God has lavished upon us. Grace, that's, that's giving people treatment that they may not necessarily deserve. We yearn to, to demonstrate this grace through our culture and our lives in a way that's transparent, real, and helpful. We are blessed to be a blessing to each other, the city of Dearborn, and the world. And that's why we give a Christmas and Thanksgiving. That's why we give baskets. And that's why, but we need to do more to expand on grace. Grace is treating people in a wonderful way that may not deserve that treatment.
And those are the people that cut you off. And those are the people that get in front of you in line. Or those are the people that say things to you that are mean. We need to have a gracious spirit towards them. One of my favorite movies is at Howard's End. Probably Val, you're the only one that's heard of that movie. Right, have you heard of it? Howard's End? Oh, yeah. Yeah. Well, there's this scene in that movie that I just love. Man, you've heard of it, too. I know you have because one of your friends suggested it as an acting scene. It's one of my favorite scenes, too. Where um, it, It's a long story, but... And I hate it when people tell other people about movies, but there's a story about this woman who falls in love with a, a, a widower. His wife has died. She's best friends with his wife. She dies. She falls in love with him. And she finds out that um, he had been with a prostitute. The prostitute actually shows up at some function and wants money from him or something like that. And um, of course, she's very, very upset. And she forgives him. Fast forward two years later, her own sister shows up pregnant out of wedlock. And all she wishes to do is spend the night in a house that he owns because it was a house that she'd fallen in love with and he absolutely refuses. So there's a scene of Emma Thompson who's terrific who says, all I'm asking you to do is to forgive my sister for the same thing I have forgiven you. And that is how we as Christians should act so much of my soul is dark and still is dark, and yet I am forgiven. And why can I not extend that forgiveness to others on a day-to-day -day basis? Church, if you want to multiply, you have to be gracious towards others and let people see that city on a hill that cannot be hid. And be gracious to your family, to the, your brothers and sisters in church, and to the stranger on the street. Grace, people are gracious. Emotion. Generosity for multiplication is not just what we believe. Giving must also connect with our hearts. We must feel the right things. We must allow our hearts to be engaged. The Apostle Paul famously said, God loves a cheerful giver. Generosity requires conviction, emotion, and action. And there must be a direct action between your heart and generosity. We see this in a number of places in Acts and 2 and 4. In Acts 2.44, Luke describes the church as being together. This is the Greek word koinonia, and it means fellowship. The implication is that people just aren't together, but they're together, and their meeting together stands for something. It stands for unity of what they believe, koinonia, fellowship. If I were to rename this church, I would rename it koinonia, simply koinonia. In Acts 2.46, we find the word together is used again. This time it's another Greek word, which means they were single-mindedness. Single-minded. That they all had uh, a purpose beyond themselves. And if you look at verse 46, you'll find it being expressed with the breaking of bread and homes, fellowship, and with joy and generous hearts. So fellowship is not just about meeting together the koinonia, but it's also about being together. And, you know, I grew up that way. I can't tell you the number of times my mom and dad would have people over for dinner after church on Sunday, spur of the moment. What are you doing for lunch? Come over to the house. Or we would go to the, we used to go to this place called the, the Egg and I or something like that. Do you remember that? Yeah. After church all the yeah. time. I, I know I loved it because they had great pancakes, you know. And we, they would go, they fellowship with each other. You know, with, and, and that's one thing we had to do. Now, we're good. We have a, a, a nice... Fellowship, I'm friends with a lot of you on Facebook, and for all Facebook's bad purposes, it is kind of nice to stay connected that way, especially during a pandemic where, you, you, where we were isolated. But now that this pandemic end is nearing, it's time for really to you know call people that we haven't seen and make a phone call or send a letter or invite them over to your house for dinner. There's nothing more revealing about a person than sitting down to a meal when they, they sharing a meal together. Acts 432 is expressed all those who believe were one heart and soul. They were unified not only what they believe, but their current concern for one another. And it's further explained in regard to how they felt about their possessions. They viewed the possessions as not being their own, and quote, no one said that any of the things that belonged to him was their own. They didn't call anything they had their own. They had all things in common. You see, mine is an emotion-loaded term. You don't have to say it loudly or emphatically. It's simply a word filled with emotion. 
mine. It is important to realize the strong emotions that are connected on what we own or what we possess. This is what the scripture warns us about keeping the eye on our hearts and our money. We tend to curl our fingers about what we have. We've talked about this. Keep your life free from the love of money, Hebrews 13, 5. For the love of money is the root of all kinds of evil. It is through this craving that some have wandered away from their faith and pierced themselves with many pangs, 1 Timothy 6, 10. Now the idea in this text is not that just money does, does, didn't have a hold on them. It's more than that. It's rather that the idea is that the love for one another creates an impetuous nature to give. The natural love for what money or possessions would give would be eclipsed by our love for one another, as we just discussed. Back to the parenting thing. When you provide for your children, you're doing so because you love them and care for them. Now, I don't have kids, but I have a dog. And I try not to be one of those persons that never had kids, so they just think their dog is a kid, because that's just messed up. And I'm not quite there yet. <laughs> But I could be. So I'm persnickety about certain things in the house. And so when I got the dog, I thought, this dog will never, ever be allowed to lay on the bed. No, no dog is ever going to lay on my bed. Mm -hmm. And she sheds. So I'm probably, this, I'm probably covered with dog hair. I, I have lint brushes strategically placed next to my reading glasses all over the house because this dog sheds all over the place. So I have now... I, I have blankets set up for her all over the house. There's one in the living room that's her blanket that she can lay on. And now there's one on the bed that she can lay on. And once a week, I take that um, blanket off the bed and I, I wash it. And once every day, I, or I try to every day, I put it in the dryer and it gets all the hair off of it. And then when I go to do laundry, sometimes I have to clean that dryer vent. I take it out and it's just this wad of matted, smelly, dander dog hair. And I'm appalled. But I clean it and I take it off and I put it back in and the next day I put her blanket back in. Why? Because my love for my dog Annie is greater than my disdain, <laughs> disdain for dog hair. You're, ask anybody who's had children what their car, the inside of their car looked like when they had kids. Oh. French fries all over the place, right? You're not going to keep a clean car or a white sofa when you got kids, right? But your love for your children is an impetuous uh, sign that you're more generous because you love them and less thought for your possessions. Our giving both individually and as entire church says something about us. Last year we talked about killing the curl. And part of the way that God makes multiplication happen is through a heart-based, emotional generosity. One soul, one heart is all in when it comes to generosity. People who love the gospel, who love the church, who love the world are generous. If we love our city, we'll be equally as generous with people in our neighborhood. Generosity has to reach from your heart, you see. Emotion. Finally, action. The final concept in generosity is to simply take action. Have the heart to be generous, and having the conviction that you should be generous doesn't mean that you are generous. Or, as you've heard me say many times, there's a difference between singing the Star Spangled Banner and joining the Army. And some of you might leave here today, as you left last week and the week before, slightly slurred, stirred emotionally with some thoughts of doing good, and your week went the same way it went week after week after week. So I urge you this week, if you're spurred on to be, uh, for, to be generous with someone, look for an opportunity to show grace this week. Just do it, as the Nike says. We see this expressed in a number of statements in Acts 2 and 4. Where we find a statement they had all things in common. We discovered that that means in two places. They were selling their possessions and belongings and distributing the proceeds to all as any had need. And there was not a needy person among them, for as many as were landowners and houses sold them and brought the proceeds of what was sold and laid at the apostles' feet. And it was distributed to each one as he had needs. These people saw their possessions as the potential means of meeting someone's needs, and they held their goods loosely. No curl. 
They were willing to sell them and meet the needs. In fact, in Acts 4.36, we learn of a man named Barnabas who did just that. He was generous. He sold his sport. We also learn of another couple that wanted to appear to be generous. And they pretended to sell the properties and give the profit at the apostles' feet. Ananias and Sapphira. And I know a childhood Sunday school song. I'm going to sing for you right now called Ananias and Sapphira got together to conspire a plot to cheat the church and get ahead. They knew God's power but did not fear it. Tried to cheat the Holy Spirit. Peter prophesied it. And they both dropped dead. <laughs> I did that because I figured once a week I had to pound on the pulpit. It just makes, you know, it's kind of like the Wizard of Oz behind the curtain. <laughs> So that teaches you what it's like to be a hypocrite about generosity, doesn't it? Generous actions are important because they validate our belief in the gospel. They show others what we believe and they give testimony to the resurrection. Generous, it takes action that's powerful and meaningful. Just look at the effect. And this is important, probably the most important. This is verse 33 of our text. And with great power, the apostles were giving their testimony to the resurrection of the Lord Jesus. And great Grace was upon them all, and day by day, attending the temple together and breaking bread in their homes, they received their food with glad and generous hearts, praising God and having favor with all the people. And the Lord added to their number day by day with those who were being saved. God multiplied their efforts. He blessed them even more. And I'm going to end with a scripture that's about more grace and more opportunity. That God's heart is willing to bless those who understand that they gain by losing. And that is what the Apostle Paul wrote in 2 Corinthians 9. God is able to make all grace abound to you so that having all sufficiency in all things at all times, you may abound in every good work. He who supplies seed to the sower and bread for food will supply and multiply your seed for sowing and increase the harvest of your righteousness. Amen. Amen. Amen.
to say a special prayer for Anne and her family and for her um, uncle's family. What was his name, Anne? Bill Sparks. Bill Sparks, who passed away uh, Friday. On Friday. So we'd like to keep the family of Bill Sparks in our prayer today. Let us go to the Lord in prayer. Father, we're so thankful for your son's blood, which is, uh, allows us to enter the veil and approach your throne with surety. And today we petition you for those who belong in this koinonia of fellowship. We pray for our sister Linda Haling, who is approaching knee surgery, that the doctors will be know your providence and your care, and she'll be uh, taken care of and uh, recover quickly. We pray for Michelle Campo, the daughter of uh, Polly Fitzpatrick, that you would comfort her and help her with her health concern. We pray for my friends Christina and Ashley Fassett, who are undergoing some major health concerns. And we pray for our brother, who belonged here to us at one time, Lou Worthington, as he faces the battle of cancer that so many have, we pray that your hand would comfort him and that you would bless him and that you would bless his family, his wife and his children, and especially his younger son, Caleb. We pray for our sister, Gail Wagner, and for Pat Stacco, that her wound would heal. We pray for our sister, Sue Wilson, and for Carrie Goldie, and today we have unspoken prayer request that the Holy Spirit knows. We pray for vision in this church. We pray for multiplication. We pray that our hearts and our minds would be changed towards generosity and for prayer and for sharing and publishing the good tidings that they know we are Christians by our love. And we pray this in the name of the Son of Jesus, of the Son of Jesus Christ who taught us to pray, Our Father, Father who art in heaven, heaven Hallowed be thy name, thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts, as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever.